my name is uh, Samaya, and um, I do a lot of very interesting things. Um, I work um, in a field uh, which is, again, a massive problem in the society. I work in the field that talks about violent behavior and how and what makes people violent. And I'm not talking about the kind of violence that you use to escape a situation or it's a tit for tat, like revengeful. It is um, violence that comes from extremist ideas and extreme ideologies. Um, and one of them, um, of course, is, um, you know, what constitutes in people like terrorists. Um, you know, they consume information, they are vulnerable, they engage in um, extremist ideas, and um, they present themselves um, uh, into these extremist groups um, and engage in violent extremism in, um, in violence on the ground. Um, it's completely planned. It's uh, not a psychopathic kind of a violence, which is um, what people used to think back then, that these are psychopaths, you know, what are they doing? Why, how do they kill people? But it all kind of links together um, uh, with very core, like fundamental things about what makes us humans. You know, there's this survival, there's, you know, uh, uh, the, you know our, our nature is very much that we, we're not here to coexist um, in the sense that we're not here to love and you know um, coexist as a group. We're here to survive, and the sh the 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 smaller and smaller groups we create, um, the better we're going to survive in the group because every individual wants to be in this group and it wants to be the leader. So this is at the very core of human behavior and how humanity is. So uh, information consumption. And what happens on the ground has direct link. And that is how I got interested in also in what I'm doing, um, you know, largely around COVID uh, for the last two years, because COVID has taken up everybody's lives and consumed everything. Um, but it's essentially, um, you know, the, the science and, you know, the information consumption around medicine and health and, you know, what, why are we um, falling for cures um, like drinking bleach and all, you know, I, I am absolutely fascinated to ask these questions and answer these questions. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about, you know, what's going on in our brains when we do things like these, we fall for these um, um, conspiracy theories. And I'm going to explain how not very simple this whole phenomenon is. It's incredibly complex. And I can, you know, we should not be judging those um, where people are falling for these ideas. Um, it is very easy to fall for propaganda, as, especially for someone who doesn't understand how it's done, especially for someone who doesn't have the literacy around information. And I'm going to tell you what exactly that is right now. So, um, you know, normally people think they understand misinformation and fake news. But um, again, I want to I want to ask you guys, what do you think fake news is? And uh, what do you think it's been all throughout history? I, I really want to understand um, how I, our audience is first. So please type on this you know, chat box on the side. Um, what do you think misinformation or fake news is? I actually don't like to call it fake news, but it's um, simplification purposes. Let's stick with that. What do you think it is? Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, news that isn't true. Um, so it's information or disinformation. Um, now, misinformation, disinformation, they're kind of, it's good to have these definitions correct, um, but misinformation essentially is um, something that isn't real, but it's propagated as real. Disinformation is something that's slightly being changed to look as real. Um, there are two different things, but collectively people just think that is misinformed, someone, you know, someone who's misinformed, someone who hasn't been given the correct information. That is what we call fake news. Um, but there's a lot of different aspects to it. And we're going to go um, into it just about in a minute. So something that is essentially false, that is what we think it is. Um, something that is misleading and something that is um, proposed as real. And um, something that is used to manipulate a population. So, you know, through social media and through you know, news channels and, um, uh, you know, outlets that have a huge reach, um, influencers, for example, um, we understand that um, these guys can say something that can reach far and wide places and uh, manipulate a huge population very quickly. And that is what something like this um, is used for. But uh, it can definitely harm a person or, ent or an entity. And we know that 
that has been happening all throughout. People who don't agree with each other uh, constantly have jives against each other and try to put the other person down. And it can happen to anybody. You don't have to necessarily be an enemy outside of the social media in real life. It can happen to people who are complete strangers, for example. Um, but another very sinister kind of way that we found out was is earning via advertising revenues through social media. Now, everybody knows that if you become really popular, um, platforms like YouTube, they give you some sort of um, revenue because of the way that advertisements work. And, and you know, uh, people, sometimes people often create such outlandish kind of videos or content that they know it's not real, but they know that it's going to be sticky. That's going to, um, you know, become really popular because it's very novel and very, um, you know, something that people haven't heard before. So that if that content has the capacity to reach more and more people or something that is highly viral, um, you know, uh, something that is um, uh, very new, um, something that has a lot of content um, around, um, you know, like five minute crafts, um, you know, it could be just anything. Um, you, we know that it doesn't work. Um, a lot of the five minute crafts videos are really bad. And, and we know that a lot of them don't work either, but they're still very popular, right? They still get millions of views. And that is just a way to get more advertising revenues. Uh, and, and these people, you know, get, get, get hundreds and thousands of dollars across the year. Um, so that is just one way um, to see why someone could be doing it. Now, recently we obviously heard just ton of COVID cures, um, everything from, you know, drinking bleach to even things that were beyond the reach of ordinary people like hydroxychloroquine, um, uh, you know, uh, remdesivir and um, ivermectin and all these drugs that actually did not have any, um, any good amount of research data behind them. They were some publications who who thought um, um, who thought these drugs actually worked in COVID, but uh, they they were false, like in in the sense that they were manipulated to make it look like uh, they were going to work. They had problems with methodologies, problems with the way that they were tested, and so on and so forth. And you needed people like us, people like scientists who, or professionals who actually understand what that means, um, to you know separate what is weed and what is chaff, per se. There will be too many cures of cancer. You know, this is from your kitchen. It's so easy. You know, you can lose weight, you know, cure every type of disease um, and so on and so forth. And they make it sound so simple and so accessible that you think it is real and you think uh, that the pharma companies are just fooling you by selling these really expensive medicine. Um, I think there is a bit of truth there, but there is also a middle line there where none of them are actually um, wholly or, you know, uh, proportionally accurate. So the other side is um, we have um, our um, good old relatives um, in WhatsApp and Facebook. Uh, they are like genuine social warriors. They're, they're, um, uh, they're afraid that the world is going in a different direction than they want it to be. And they really want other people to understand and know the information that they've received, that they've um, given the attention to, and it's it's got their um, um, it's got their uh, attention, and they want to spread the same information because they think it is real, or it could be. But they think, oh, I'm at least benefiting some people. Um, you know, this cannot be that harmful. At least I want some people to know, and they actually drive pleasure in that. They think they're doing the right thing. You know, but they don't have any understanding of the way information systems work. This is what majority of the people fall into the trap of. While they're honestly good, um, uh, you know, they, they have good intentions, but at the same time, uh, they don't understand uh, the system and they don't understand, um, um, you know, whether it's about information or how social media works or how revenue generation works, or even about, you know, the science of or the mechanics of whatever the information that they're sharing. And uh, these are one of the most concerned people because it's very difficult to make them understand something. Um, they've, you know, received this across years and years. They're generally the older side of the population and they've already made certain decisions in their head and it's very difficult to change them. Um, so all of this that you think it does, but it's actually a lot more sinister than that. It's actually um, a way more um, organized uh, then what what this all is. This we already knew about. This we already thought that we understood about misinformation. 
Um, but here's the next thing. Okay, this is what it is. So <clears throat> in reality, we think that it's only on social media, right? Um, it's not wholly true. You can have misinformation everywhere. Um, it could be voice, audio, it could be a video, it could be a combination of them. It could be sliding into actual medical journals. It could be a part of TV shows. It could be a part of film. You know, any media um, that conveys information, even word of mouth, that could have misinformation. Um, and television could portray something that is similar to an actual event but without saying anything, but because it's so powerful and it is, um, it goes to so many people, you know, it has a huge reach. It can actually change people's, um, um, you know, uh, the thought processes around that event that they're talking about. They could change in a couple of names here and there, but it would look so similar um, that um, people would think that it is actually, you know, trying to convey uh, the very information that has been hidden. Um, people have books constantly that, that talk about a lot of these kind of things. And we have to be uh, kind of aware that every information or every new information that you receive from anywhere, um, that has the potential to be fake, right? And this is how we kind of approach every single thing and, and how we approach, um, we can talk about it in a bit. So it could be propaganda, right? It doesn't have to be just pure, you know, these people are evil, you know, full stop. It, it, it could be, um, you know, many ways of people saying that these guys have been benefiting across, say, you know, a group of Jews benefiting across Eastern Europe, um, you know, in, in the early part of the 1900s, and we need to do something with it. Uh, we don't want Jews in in, in Europe and we want to get rid of it. And we have propaganda, we have an entire machinery going behind it. And we have people like Joseph Goebbels, um, who even, who's actually the propaganda minister of the Nazi Germany. And you know, that was misinformation that they were spreading, um, how these people were uh, way wealthier, way beneficial, um, and you know, taking over the world in a way. And they were in minorities, but uh, that was the pro propaganda uh, sent across in Europe. And then you have something like hate speech. You are um, uh, essentially pulling a group or a person or you know an organization down uh, by directing hate towards them. And hate speech is, I, I actually hate this, using the word hate speech because it's been overused. And everywhere we talk about um, you know, uh, hate towards um, a group of people that are minorities or LGBTQ communities or women or, we constantly use hate, hate speech, but it's way beyond that. It is not just directed hate directed towards an individual or a group. Um, uh, you know, it, it is a mixture of uh, selective information um, with a little bit of misinformation with other things. It's narrative building. It's, it's a whole lot of things. Um, but if you see that there is um, a, a very overt or even covert type of uh, way where a, a group is criticized beyond a certain point, then you got to question that too and why it's happening. Um, the next bit is my favorite. I, I love speaking with these guys. I love how uh, these guys have um, grown. Um, very, I mean, at least now we know. The reason why I say I love that, that now at least we know um, what part of the world um, is into this kind of stuff. I mean, before we used to think about just flat earthers, right? Um, we used to think about people who would believe that the earth is flat and there's nothing you could do about it. There would be just an odd number of people. But now, um, especially after what happened in the Capitol in Washington, DC um, in January 6th last year, um, all of these people have kind of come together, whether it's anti-vaxxers or pro-freedom or flat earthers or science deniers and climate change uh, deniers and all these people um, and, you know, very racist, um, pro um, far right or alt right people, they've all kind of come together and created this nice little bunch. And now we know which person has a tendency to do what, the deeper you are into conspiracy theory, um, otherwise very uh, loosely labeled as misinformation, but uh, the deeper you are into it, the more um, damage you've already done 
to yourself um, because it's very hard to come out of it because then you're going to question every decision that you've made in the last you know so many years or months that you've been into that um, uh, conspiracy um, uh, hole and um, of course we know that it causes radicalization um how it doesn't i mean when i used to study when isis was its at its peak a couple of years ago i i used to notice uh, exclusively twitter was used to recruit people um for isis and um, and it was the same thing for instagram um, a lot of the foreign fighters that went from the uk and europe and the us were recruited on instagram um through propaganda and and then uh, they actually Uh, you know they they would um, kind of single out people who had more interaction on these kind of posts and then they would talk in the dms and then that's how they would would get recruited and would get transported to um raqqa back then so absolutely it can radicalize people depends on how vulnerable you are and how eager you are to absorb this kind of content um it causes extremist beliefs of course um conspiracy theories propaganda radicalization they're all a part of them it causes violence and physical harm not just for someone else but also for yourself and i'm saying that because um with covid and what happened with covid a lot of people started consuming such things that actually caused more harm to them than other people and i mean of course radicalization causes violence political violence or terrorism but it also causes self harm to your own self i mean there used to be uh misinformation about people um cutting them their own selves to let a little bit of blood out and this is in, in the in the history of how medicine worked they used to cut a little bit of you know their arm so that they could let the blood out, blood out and they would believe that blood letting as a practice um would release some of the demons and the ghosts or any of the things that was causing whatever their medical concern was in some cases they would drill actual holes in their skulls to get rid of headaches because they thought demons were sitting inside and this is how uh, in in the past history you know uh, misinformation was kind of making people harm themselves um so it it is not as simple as just a just, just a relative sharing you know things on whatsapp it can be very very sinister it can be very planned i mean uh, you know everybody has probably heard about um facebook and how it's been under the spotlight everybody's probably also heard about cambridge analytica or at least some people i would suggest some people i guess um <clears throat> so um so um oh i i'm going to get a lot of questions on the side that i did not pay attention to um <clears throat> there are, there are people who are asking things like what is the psychology behind spreading in, uh, misinformation it is very very complex um and it's not just um um uh, it's not just revenue making or um uh you know you know spreading hate for the other person just because there is um in fact there are some papers that talked about how a specific type of personality disorder kind of made you more um susceptible to spreading it not creating but spreading information um and those were the people who actually were quite reliable who would never kind of um uh, stray away from the authority and you know always would be with the establishment so there are different kind of uh, uh, theories around it but i think it's really dependent on the context it's not psychosis or, or any of that i think it's very easy to label people as such um but um uh, we should not go into that uh, uh, labeling people as psychosis um, very quickly um we we'll probably and do the qna qna a little bit later i think we would um uh, we'll probably do it at the end of the session um <clears throat> so hang on i'll just i can't see my screen because of this okay i think i might need a little bit of help because okay clear drawings i started some annotation yeah so um <clears throat> yes i will answer them towards the end um i can't um, um, get rid of it okay well 
let's do that towards the end. So they're very sinister and planned, like Cambridge Analytica. Um, you always have to ask where the money or where the power is and, you know, who's funding something. Um, it, it doesn't have to be just something on WhatsApp, you know. I look at funding in research all the time. Who's funding it? For example, the vaccine that uh, we recently saw, um, AstraZeneca, you know, it got funded by the public money in the UK um, uh, and it was then made in, um, researched in Oxford University and then it was given out to uh, this British Swedish company and then, uh, you know, they made it and then manufactured it. And so there were like multiple steps in the middle. Um, if, for example, you know, you have to question if, if there's a vaccine company who not only has done the research, but also is, you know, the 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 company that is profiteering from it because they are the manufacturers, they are the researchers, they are the distributors, or any other drug, not just the vaccine. You have to really question the data that is coming from them. Is it really true? Because in science, there's a lot of trust around whatever gets presented as. Yes, there is peer review and there are steps to get around it. But um, you can essentially slip in a lot of the bad stuff, a lot of the fake stuff that never even happened in the lab. Um, and that is why we have so many um, cases of academic misconducts and things like that coming out. And there's actual area, there are researchers that focus just on that. So that is also misinformation. It's also fake news um, that people put out in journals, uh, science journals in particular. And then um, another thing is that it, it doesn't have to be um, overt. It's not as easy as uh, A plus B is equal to C. It could be totally like hidden in and camouflaged. And an example of that is a lot of the large um, uh, one hour, two hour YouTube videos that get around. And um, what happens is that uh, you will have a one hour video saying a lot of the things that are real and they're important and probably useful. But then in the middle of it, one or two instances where we can't detect or even an algorithm won't be able to detect what is misinformation and what is not, they will slip in certain instances where um, it would be misinformation and that would get sticky um, and that would kind of be circulated around. So um, and, and it's impossible to for, for fact checkers to look at those things, um, you know, sit and look at long YouTube videos and people, uh, it, it only takes a, an hour to create a Babel video, um, but it takes a lot of time for people like us to fact check them. So it is really dependent also on the content makers and also the platform to kind of moderate those things and um, and, and see what they're publishing is, is real or not. <clears throat> um, what it also does, um, and very importantly, it is changes behaviors. I mean, I can't stress that enough, how important has um, misinformation or generally um, uh, the, the, the problems around social media change the way that um, we act in real life. Um, you know, we nearly everything that we hear uh, in terms of news or information is through social media. If there wasn't WhatsApp, I mean, I can't remember the last time I texted someone on actual text messaging. Um, it is so, so important now. And that is in, in a way changing our behavior to a way where we're friends with certain people and we're not friends with certain people because of social media. Um, and and not, it's not just friends. It has ruined long-standing friendships and relationships. There are so many people who now know that certain people in their families are not to be um, spoken with or messed around because they are of a certain kind. They are uh, very pushy. They, they would uh, uh, impose their ideas, which may or may not be real. Um, they could be misinformed totally, but because they are um, of a certain type, they will push those ideas uh, very vehemently onto other people. And it has ruined the way that uh, people look at their, you know, in India, you know, especially uncles and aunties and, and, and those type of people. So it's, it's really has changed a, a, a lot of our behaviors, um, not just with the general public, but also with, with our own people, with the people that we hold close. Um, and, and, and really it is, it is everybody's problem. It's, it's not, it's not just the problem of journalists. It's not the problem of governments or policymakers or, you know, politicians. It is everybody's problem. It's not just a researcher problem. Um, it is even a problem of a stay-at-home mom um, uh, who has 
um, who has a child who is only 12 year old, but will be uh, turning 13 next year, uh, because that 13 year old is going to be eligible for Instagram um, and for, you know, TikTok and Twitter and all these things. And, and if you're joining social media as a child, as a parent, you have to be the most worried person because guess what, who gets more and more into um, conspiracy theories or radicalization? Um, kids who have still not understood how the sphere works. It takes knowledge and understanding and, and probably years of um, schooling to get to a point where we can say we understand something. But these guys are naive 12 year olds who are going to be on social media and there are predators out there who are looking for specifically those type of people who don't understand this and kids are one of them. So everyone has to be a solution to this, everyone's problem. Um, ooh, um, am I visible? Am I? Yeah, um, your uh, video is off. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, back. Yeah, it's back. Okay, great. Great. Um, I have some notes in my um, slides and I'm not able to kind of access them because I've kind of just... Uh, just a moment. Um, okay. Okay, that's that's it. That's what I wanted. Okay, so um, what does it do? Okay, what you know? How does it work? And you know, what does it do to people? So these guys use a very. Um, he said this use a very, very simplistic procedure, right? Um, um, they make things extremely simple. They basically change the way that people remember information. So how, um, how it, not, not how it spreads, but how, um, how misinformation uh, is injected into society is uh, they, it changes the way that we perceive information or we remember information. And there is a very good, um, a very simple study that I looked at um, earlier. And it's, it's been just, it's one of the oldest studies and I, I, I love it um, because um, we've known this all along, but yet we, we fall for it, right? So it changes the way that we remember um, events. So important events. And uh, say Holocaust, you know, everybody has, you know, everybody who lived back then knows that it happened, um, at least in that part of the world, everybody has a very strong memory of it. They can't deny Holocaust. If you lived in Germany, if you lived in that part of Europe, um, you can't deny that it didn't happen, right? Um, it did happen, absolutely. And a lot of people um, actually existed even back then that they denied that it did it happened because of the way that propaganda was used to change the way that they have seen certain types of events. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you how, um, uh, uh, how that um, actually takes into effect in real life, but the, the collaborative um, um, effect is called the misinformation effect. So what is it and how, how does it change um, us uh, as people? Um, so, <clears throat> So memories are very malleable, right? Everything that we see becomes a memory, right? Either it's a short-term memory or a long-term memory. But um, if we are fed a certain type of information, it stays in our memory. So if we see something, an event, right? It stays in our memory. And then there is another barrage of information that adds to that memory, right? And that second or third, you know, barrages of information that keep coming, that changes that original memory of event. And um, th there was a cognitive uh, neuroscience kind of uh, study uh, that talked about it. And, and they didn't use complicated ideas like, you know, violence or pe whether people remembered Holocaust or not. They used fairly simple things. Now, <clears throat> they um, it, it simulated like an automobile accident. And you can see that like two pictures here. And I quoted the study that, uh, that was done in the 1974. Um, and <clears throat> half of the subjects received um, misinformation about the accident, while the other half got no misinformation, right? And then all of the subjects were made to remember the original event or the accident that happened. 
so uh, um in in um, a study that used that paradigm subjects uh, or the participants that were the subjects uh, they saw an accident um and then they the, the the people who got the misleading information or misinformation they got the false suggestion that there was a stop sign right so in the in the a picture a you can see there's a stop sign um on the right and that was the misinformation and they thought okay well if there's a stop sign the vehicle should have stopped and not gone further but what they had actually seen was the yield sign which is what is here at the bottom and um when they were later asked you know the people both people um what do you remember at the intersection of that accident when it happened do they remember um the stop sign or the yield sign so the people who were given the false information that it was a stop sign they adopted that as a part of their memory and now claim that that was the actual accurate memory that they had even though they actually looked at something else so you know there are hundreds if not thousands of similar studies that show that how misinformation can really change an individual's recollection of the memories that they have so so the events that they see and you know they become the memories and how they are recollected later in in their lifetimes and that becomes a very powerful predictor of you know how how any type of information um can change you so um it, you know this okay this is just the caption that i should have um i should have um, popped earlier uh, but you could see the traffic with stop stop sign and the b is the one with the yield sign um so anyone interested look at um a loft sin palmer and it's, it's a brilliant study very simplistic you can even manipulate a little bit of this and throw it onto the people around you and you probably be surprised with the result so um okay the next one so how we stand i think one of the most important questions um okay uh i the screen has been uh, showing all the notes to all, okay well i think i've been using something that should not be used um wait maybe there's another way to do this can you still see okay probably not no we can't see your screen anymore okay 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 um okay and uh, just a moment while i try to figure this out i am some how very very challenging technology today i'm normally not like this uh it is 11:30 in the night or past 12 o'clock and uh um as probably okay is it still showing my entire screen yeah okay uh is there a way uh, to remove uh, uh, the notes um, in this is this a way to remove the notes or there isn't a way um if you end the show and try um, play from current slide maybe that will help okay play from current slide yeah now that... i can't see your notes yeah okay but i need to see my notes so how do i get myself to see the notes um okay
I guess um I I guess we'll just go with it. Um I don't know how to figure this out. Uh, I'm so sorry about that, but I guess we'll just have to go with it. Um, can we? Um, okay, is there a way that we could just do a portion of the screen and uh, maybe that would help? Okay, how about this? How does that look? Works. We can't see your notes. Yes, okay, perfect. Good. Um, so, yeah, so <clears throat> finally, so we can do this. Um, so what it does is it, it essentially, this is this is the real deal. This, this is how, you know, we explain um, how we are so gullible, how we can uh, so easily fall for it. Um, it basically catches our attention. You know, everybody knows how outlandish, how um, unexpected, how novelty, um, you know, parts of misinformation are. But that's not just that. We have a tendency to only process or send information to our higher sensory organs, our higher stages of processing, cognitive processing, that is unexpected and new and novel. So um, I'll, I'll give you a very brief example. Um, uh, something that you're already used to doing, um, it will become almost automated and you could just do it in the background. But if something is completely new, so um, a, type of, a type of touch that feels very different, uh, right, a type of um, you know um, uh, clothing uh, which is a very different in its texture. It will feel very different, and you'll be reminded throughout the day that oh, I'm wearing something that is new. This is novel information. Um, something that you're used to wearing, something that you know how it feels, and you know sits on your skin. Um, it doesn't get constantly reminded, um, and you know your brain doesn't kind of go on to tell you throughout the day that hey, you're wearing this cotton T-shirt that you've been wearing forever. Um, it doesn't remind you all the time. So it, new novel information, your brain will absorb that. And, and there's a reason, there's a reason um, why that happens. It, it wants to reduce the load, um, the, the load uh, that it takes to process that information. So the, the, it, it is talking about you know, calorie preservation. Um, so the more processes you have, the more calories that you're using for those processes. And you, your, brain's, your brain's trying to kind of conserve that energy. So, um, you know, there, there's an experiment um, where they actually measured how novel information, new information was seen in your brain. And this is where um, uh, the figures were. And it was found that um, any visual stream, any new incoming visual stream that was, um, uh, that was correlated with this area called the anterior hippocampus. Right, and the anterior hippocampus, um, it's, it's very interesting. It, it does a lot of other different things, but in this particular, um, you know, um, in this particular case, um, we, we kind of um, have unexpected events um, uh, directed in such a way um, that uh, we can detect something very rapidly, right? And uh, it, it, essentially, uh, the coding of this visual stimulus um, in the cortical and subcortical structures that we have, um, it, it um, correlates, um, so the visual coding correlates uh, with uh, the processing of that novelty. So, uh, so if you have this, um, you know, bilateral network, which is like um, corticothalamic, um, it, that is, you know, dictated by surprise or information, uh, which is completely novel, um, then it is kind of linked uh, with the new visual stimulus that comes in. And together, it kind of makes the effect that we see. So what we see is on the left that we see, it's the um, posterior fusiform complex that we see at the basal part of it. And then you could see the premotor cortices with it. So, you know, the, the, the premotor cortices 
um, the, the anterior, uh, intraparietal sulcus uh, that we see at the top, they're all, oops, I'm totally, uh, I'm, I'm really bad at this right now, um, but um, maybe I could just move this a little bit. Yeah, so the IPS that you see, the intraparietal sulcus, um, the fusiform um, and the premotor, um, the premotor cortex, they all kind of come together um, when there was a particular sensory related event visualized. So this fMRI, I would say is a technique that is not like a, like a scan of the brain that we normally go to the doctors. This is like an event specific. Um, it is like a, a, a functional MRI. So an individual is kind of put in the scanner and they're made to do certain things. So in this case, they were like shown a video of something which was completely novel. So that is how the, uh, the and, and then, you know, through the imaging technique, they saw what was highlighted when they saw that particular video. So what they, what they saw was the visual side of it interacting with this other beautiful structures like the fusiform, um, basically together, which is called the bilateral corticothalamic network. Um, and we saw how surprise kind of activated that. So that was like a very, very important, very um, uh, important study uh, to talk about how new signals interact um, and what are the structures related in the brain that would do that. Um, so essentially what happens is everything new that comes around the line, um, you can adapt, you can predict these things. And then you have the capacity to quiet them down, right? So it, it, that itself is, is motivation. So anything new kind of drives that motivational reward in your head. It takes your attention and then you'll be like, okay, I know this, you know, I can look after, and I, I can look up for this. I don't need to keep remembering it again and again, right? So dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, what it does, it does anticipatory reward. Um, now uh, it increases uh, when we are faced with novelty. So anytime you have a novel object coming towards you, you, you release this hormone, called, uh, sorry, you release this neurotransmitter called dopamine. And um, in, in, in a certain way that also acts as a reward um, for your brain. So you feel good when you see that, right? And uh, it, it shows that hippocampus in some way also creates newer connections in your brain, like synaptic connections, what we call. They are basically connections from one um, neuron, which is like a cell, and to another neuron, which is another cell in the brain. So they create these new connections and it increases the plasticity of the brain by doing that. Um, and the more novel, um, or, or, you know, uh, uh, content that it's exposed to, the 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 more plastic it becomes. So essentially learning a new language and you know those kind of things, it increases plasticity because it is novel. So the potential for learning um, new concepts and you know new things is immense in this. So it, it also rewards you in those ways. But at the same time, um, they reduce exponentially when there is when something is not novel. So I mean we label this as desensitization, but um, uh, you know, and, and I was talking about touch earlier, uh, but you know how you cut your nails after a long time and the skin under the, your nail bed, it kind of feels a little funny. It, it, you touch it and it feels slightly funny than what it used to be because it's not sensitized in, enough. It, it has this new touch feeling. Once you are used to it and you keep touching that area, your brain is not going to tell you this unique new sensory, you know, new sensation. It will tell you um, that you're used to it. You know, um, that is kind of desensitization is. Um, so your brain does that with a lot of other content. And you, when you keep getting this information, there is some sort of a sensitivity. So, so misinformation potentially um, has to have an angle of novelty. Uh, it has to grab your attention. It has to remain there and be sticky. And it has to be completely outlandish. And the only way that it can do that is through telling you something that you've never heard before. You know, that's like the novelty concept of it. And as a result of that, you create these false memories, as I talked about earlier, this misinformation effect. So the region responding to the novel stimulus, um, uh, you know, so you have the stimulus, incoming stimulus, and then you have, a you have the processing, and then you have the response to it. So the reason, uh, the, the, the region uh, called substantia, substantia nigra, which basically it's a little darkish colored um, area, or the ventral segment, uh, segmental area, VTA, it's closely linked with that hippocampus and the amygdala that we talked about earlier. 
And both of these are very, very important in learning and memory and also dopamine regulation. So what happens is that when the hippocampus, um, you know, when um, it compares the stimulus against the existing memories and say, okay, I know about this, right? Um, so it also strengthens and it responds to the emotional stimulus and it, it creates these long-term memories. So you, the, the more information you add, the more like rigid or calcification of memories happens. And majority of these long-term memories occur during your sleep, right? So it consolidates, your brain consolidates your memory during sleep. So the more um, stuff, you know, the more stuff you add to it and then you sleep over it, then you're literally building on to a false memory that you didn't have before. You remembered a real event, but then you added more misinformation on top of it. Now the, the, the recollection of that memory is completely changed, right? So uh, this, this also happens in a very, very limited time frame. So you have a very little time to integrate all of this information. So uh, the brain has a way to like adapt or prioritize this information. So very highly provocative information um, that has a, in a way, a stronger chance of lingering in your minds and incorporate into these um, long-term memory banks. So, so the, the more provocative it is, the more outlandish it is, the longer, the, the higher chances of it becoming uh, consolidated um, as a, as a long-term memory. And, uh, you know, obviously they're not just outlandish, they also appeal to your emotional side. You know, they, they make you tell, you know, they, they, they tell you that, um, you know, somebody is getting killed, somebody that you relate, that you relate with, somebody is um, uh, getting beaten up or somebody is going to die if you don't do this. And they, they, they really want to hijack your learning and memory circuitry. And it goes a long way, um, you know, that, that one thing will, will, it has a very sticky effect. It, it really remains in your brain for a long period of time. And that is the, you know, that is the largest selling point of it. And um, not just it happens um, during the sleep period, it, it also happens um, because there is a, a higher degree of emotion. Um, and, you know, that, again, we go back to dopamine and, and we suggest that everything uh, around this cognitive reward um, is linked with dopamine. And the, the, the higher this emotional um, context of whatever that you are getting, the more likely you're going to be feeling like you want to send this across so the more and more people find out about it. And this is how you also gain cognitive reward. And, um, you know, it's a very simple formula. You want to keep it simple. You want to keep it sticky. And you want to say it over and over and over. So exposed to, you know, when you're exposed to fake news, um, you can, uh, you know, later on, um, you know, there's an increase um, in, in, in the belief. So a fake news headline can increase um, a later belief in that headline. So just, just you scrolling through your social media feeds, um, it, it lays, it's laden with that emotionally provocative content that just has the way to change the way we see the world and not just political decisions, but it can also um, impact every single decision in your life, you know, um, which, which one to buy, you know, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, which thing to buy in your life and which thing that you need in your life. All of that is driven. I mean, when you look at Instagram posts, it has a huge section where it is just about um, shopping, you know, whether you need it or not, it will kind of gather information from your activity on social media and tell you exactly what you need. And sometimes you're surprised that why is this thing there? You know, I didn't even tell Instagram that I was interested in this. Um, but it's, it's essentially going through it again and again and again. Um, it, the, the, the ads will kind of target you and eventually they'll make you buy it. So that's kind of the repetition aspect of it. So you know, we, we obviously rely on our ability to place information into this emotional context, um, but it combines our facts and our feelings. So eventually what happens is that all these information that comes, it, you've changed the events in the past that you've actually experienced and felt with this misinformation, and then it's done in a repeated way over and over and over. And long before we're aware, we already have made that decision. And when we've made that decision, we don't even recollect how it was made. Like if you've made a certain decision, you can't go back in time and, and go over every single step of that misinformation consumption um, to understand how exactly you did so because your emotion is involved. And once your emotion is involved, 
um, all of that is meaningless. All of that in the background kind of goes out of the window. And what you believe right now and how you feel about it, only that bit is important. And th so there's no uh, there's no recollection of that original stimulus that made you believe in something that you're believing right now. Essentially, this is like the basis of conspiracy theories or you know, and information consumption in general. Um, again, you're making decisions. You know, it's it's coming from this very deep seated emotion, um, and very difficult to identify. You can't trace it back all the way uh, to the initial um, uh, information that you got, um, and you have something called this emotion catalog that you refer to. And, you know, it's very simplistic to say you have the positive and the negative tags. I mean, people who do some, you know, uh, natural language processing and, you know, emotional labeling, they always kind of look at what is positive uh, sentiment and what is the negative sentiment. But I actually don't like using these words, but it is really what it is. Your brain wants to make things very, very simple and you think about this person as a thumbs up or a thumbs down. That's that's all you think about. And then you put them in different cataloging characterization. Again, this is a process where your brain is trying to conserve energy. And once you do that, you kind of recollect an information back, back from your memory and remember the emotion around it, whether it was a positive uh, emotion or a negative emotion, and you go on with that. I mean, you're, you want to, as a person, informed want to remember the nuances but a lot of the time when it comes to highly emotional charged information you don't remember those nuances all you remember is the very simplistic aspects of it or elements of it so something which is very highly emo emotional and provocative that has the power to change the way we see the world and make decision important decisions like political decisions so uh, how do we stop it you know uh, absolutely not um, uh, using counter propaganda against pro propaganda. I mean, um, you know, that is something that people have been people have been doing across centuries. I and mean, this is not something that you'd want to do um, in this day and age. We want to inform people about the propaganda that we see, um, and there is not one way to do it. I mean, we have fact checkers. I am a fact checker, but I know that fact checking is just not enough. I know that giving out fact checks or giving out people information that is reliable, um, that is not the way to go, or that is not the only way to go rather. Um, we need to have accountability of people who spread that, that kind of misinformation, especially something that is sinister and the, that has the ability to harm people. And you know, we have people uh, who got shadow bans um, for repeatedly being offenders on social media, repeatedly spreading, spreading hate speeches or um, you know, fake news, as we call it. You know, Trump was another guy. Um, but what happens is they go and they create their own social medias. They have gaps and all these other um, uh, platforms that um, are actually not mainstream, but still very much mainstream. But um, we also need to know things that are um, um, in terms of where the, the, where the funding is coming from, right? You know, as I talked about earlier, we need to know who's sponsoring certain trials of uh, drugs, for example, who's sponsoring, um, you know, um, Facebook, for example, um, you know, when, when there are a lot of uh, um, journalists, um, you know, um, reporting on particular news, political news in particular, um, you know, where are these advertisers? Who, are, who is funding them? Who's funding those journalism platforms? Um, and, uh, you know, Facebook does a lot of these type of fundings. Um, and Facebook also has been uh, in the limelight for uh, using propaganda. So, you know, you have to really see, you know, what is coming first, the chicken or the egg, you know, it's kind of part of the whole problem itself. I mean, I would criticize every social media company here because they still need to do enough. But there are certain social media companies that have gone above and beyond to not do um, anything. Um, another thing that we could do is teaching information literacy. And so this is something that we're, we're actually planning to do. Um, as a part of um, uh, some of the work that um, Violent is doing and with, in collaboration with Alt News in India. Uh, we're trying to teach younger kids who are going to be a part of social media ecosystem soon. So these are like 12 to 15 year old kids. We're going to teach um, information literacy and how to do more, in, how to be more emotionally engaged and uh, uh, you know have how to have critical thinking throughout the learning process and how to look at every information they see them through that lens. Um, another thing that we could do is teach more science. But today itself, I had um, a really nasty messages from somebody who was a mathematician 
but that person was an anti-vaxxer, that person was a, a climate change denier, um, and supported that recent Serbian uh, sports person who was coming to Australia, um, and um, you know, and, and the things around that. So, you know, simply teaching mathematics or science doesn't make you that way. You need to teach how to apply those skills to the general world. So, teaching critical thinking more important. But one thing, as a neuroscientist, that I could say is, you should be able to um, miss, you know, because misinformation spreads with some sort of a cognitive reward, like you, there's dopamine, right? And dopamine is used as a cognitive reward. Yes, there is reward around um, uh, advertisements and revenues around them and becoming popular and all that. But becoming popular, those likes and all that, they are giving you this, this cognitive reward that we call dopamine. Um, we should be able to use that same motivation and that, you know, it can be in, um, you know, whether you're talking about information literacy or teaching science or critical thinking, it can come in a lot of these different aspects, but we should be able to use that same reward to stop it. And, and I think that is such a crucial, um, uh, you know, step to take because nobody recognizes that if we're using dopamine to spread misinformation, we can actually use it to reduce that too. You know how misinformation has this quality where the worst type of post always gets more, more likes and more shares? We should be able to create a system of reward, um, you know, a dopamine, um, where the, the good posts or the factually sound posts get the same type of, um, you know, reach, like likes or some, something along those lines, you know, in, increased shares. So you know how Twitter kind of um, uh, has promoted certain scientists during the time of the pandemic and, and those kind of things, but it has to be more thought through. I think it's not that as simple as that, but it's just something to think about in the way we use um, this tool to stop uh, misinformation. So um, it, it's coming from this general idea of how uh, even trivial rewards, um, it can strongly influence behavior. Like it's a small ego boost. That could be enough. It's just, you know, just the post is receiving likes. And for someone who's never received likes, yes, you can desensitize with it eventually. But if someone who's never received likes, a couple of likes for them, it goes a long way. Engagement with other followers, you know, um, it, it's it, people can get really lucrative deals out of those things. So if we give reward to people who are factually correct, then we're actually stopping this type of, you know, highly high reach of uh, misinformation per se. Um, Maya, so I'm really sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, this is my sorry last slide. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, the this next is my last slide. Yeah, yes. yes. Yeah, sorry about the thing in the middle, um, uh, what happened, but this is my last slide. So uh, lastly, most importantly, um, because Right now, the information consumption comes from social media. Um, what can tech do as a result of it? Um, and I'm using this quote from a uh, nature paper um, by Tally. To quell misinformation, um, we don't just use sticks, we also use carrots. Um, so, you know, if something is appealing to the masses, even if it's poor quality, they're getting rewarded, right? So we have to produce a system that is a good carrot system. And um, so in Sweden, we have this thing called the uh, bonus malice system, which is a reward system for drivers, right? If you drive your car less, you get certain type of rebates, because that is not like kind of, uh, you know, removing that, uh, that, you know, driver kilometers from your carbon um, footprint that you can have. So it, it's a good system. So, so people would use less cars. Um, and in the same way that kind of bonus malice system, a good carrot system, um, it needs to be carefully developed, but it has to be in place, um, uh, you know, combining all the skills of people who are engaged in it, you know, not just scientists, but also, you know, psychologists, people, you know, who, who work with the industry, uh, misinformation, tech, economists. So this healthy information ecosystem, um, we add these carrots, these reward points in the middle. So and, and these should be visible rewards that others can see, because a lot of this dopamine generation is also about peer review, you know, validation, the other person seeing my carrots, that is really important too. So if such a system would work, um, there's a natural human tendency to select that actions uh, that give you bigger rewards. So if you select actions that are giving you bigger reward that are correct and just and the right thing to do, people will naturally do those actions instead of promoting the behaviors that are actually wrong for you. 
So that will generate this trustworthy material and um, it will you know, signal to the people on social media that this post is dependable, it's right, and it doesn't have any misinformation. On behalf of the entire team at India Science Festival, I would like to extend a very, very big thanks to you, Dr. Sheikh. Thank you so much for joining us so late in the night. I can imagine it's so difficult. But it's such a no pleasure problem. and uh, such an important uh, point that you uh, addressed in this session today. And I think it's very, very relevant in the times that we live in, especially with the pandemic. But it was an absolute pleasure and we hope to host you at the next edition of this festival, hopefully in an offline on-ground session in India. Hey!